now is the keynote speaker who recently addressed the Federal Reserve, IMF, and World Bank, Nomi Prenz. She is also the author of All the Presidents as Bankers. Nomi, it was amazing because you were interviewed three weeks ago here, and your warnings were basically that the system was going to crash, that it was going to implode. Here's a quote when I asked you about the 2001 to 2003 collapse and the 2008-9. You said when it implodes, meaning the financial system this time, it will implode more dangerously, end quote. And we just saw a Chinese stock market it crashed. The government's intervened there. They have a the stock market bouncing. But coming on the heels of that interview that we did with you, I thought it was incredible the timing of that when you were warning repeatedly that this financial system is in trouble and it's going to implode. Can you talk about what just unfolded in your opinion? Yeah, you know, it relates to the unfolding in China. And of course, the markets don't back up because of the government interventions, but they are down about 25% now from that. 32% in just a month. So certainly an intense decline in an incredibly short period. If you had invested in the Chinese market for the first time in the beginning of June, you would have lost 25% of your capital at this point. So that's what happened on the surface. Beneath the surface, what happened in China is part of what is happening globally, which is that the advent of cheap money perpetuated by the central banks of the world most acutely in the United States and in Europe for the major banks of the United States and Europe has had the extra outcome of creating a lot of speculation in stock markets throughout the world, not just in China. China has its own uh, local investors, but it also has international capital as well in that market because it has become a more open market over the years than it has before. So it is part of this global financial system in every way at this point. China missed the catastrophe of the financial crisis of 2008-2009 because it was less involved at that point in the build-up to that crisis. In the prior period, of cheaper rates through the mid-2000s that ultimately created a lot of bad loans, subprime loans and so forth, that were securitized and toxified and distributed throughout the world for which people borrowed extra money to pay for more of them and so forth. And when that all collapsed, it brought down the financial system. And since then, these central banks have been propping up the system. It's not just my belief, but even the DIS, the Bank of International Settlements, which is the central bank to the central bank, just issued a mid-year report where it said that the global markets are dependent on the help of the central bank. So it's very worried about that situation. So when you have all of that going on coming out of the financial crisis of 2008-2009 and this cheap artificial liquidity perpetuating all the global market increases, when there's any factor that comes in that could disturb the idea of that liquidity being around forever, for markets going up forever, things turn around very quickly. And what we just saw in China this week was margin calls, basically, or people and, and companies having borrowed money because it was cheaper than it used to be in the past in order to buy stock. And when the stock started to go down a little bit, they have these margin calls, meaning they have to post more money because the stocks were actually the collateral to the money they borrowed. And if they're going down in value, the collateral is going down in value, which means they need to post more in order to continue to stay in the game. In order to post more, they have to sell more stocks to raise the money. If they sell more stocks, the stocks go down. That's something that happens in very many bear crashes. You know, if there's too much borrowed money in the market, the moment anyone has to pay back what they borrowed, they have to sell stocks to do it. And it becomes a self-perpetuating downward spiral. That's exactly what happened in China. That's what happened in the 1929 crash in the United States. People had margin calls. They needed to find the money. They sold stocks. Stocks went down in the United States. They went down around the world. Economies imploded. We had a Great Depression for years. Chinese government afterwards came in and issued controls and said, for example, if shareholders own a certain percentage of a company, they're not allowed to sell it for six months. And that contains some of the damage from the plummet that we saw earlier in the week, but that's really only a temporary measure. That doesn't fix the problem, but there's a lot of borrowed money and artificial liquidity that's popped up these markets to begin with. And it isn't just China. This is something that's prevalent throughout the world. No market, not in the United States, not in Europe, is immune from the fact that the money that's in these markets is artificially created. It's not growth money. It's not 
earned money. It's artificially created by the central banks of the world through the private banking system into these markets, and it can go as quickly as it comes in. No, you were bringing that up in your last interview as well. You said, quote, right now, everyone knows whether they admit it or not, the cheap money is the only thing that's keeping this global financial system afloat. It isn't production. It isn't savings of individuals because nobody has any money to save. So there is no there, there, end quote. When you saw the Chinese market collapse, I'm sure that didn't surprise you. I mean, maybe the speed of it did. But the question I have for you is, could something similar happen in the United States? Because our cash and others have warned about that for quite some time. And I'm just wondering if we could see that kind of implosion happen here where there seems to be almost no bids under the market and it just goes into a massive free fall. Can that happen here? It, it can happen. What, what is said about the whole global implosion is that it can also happen in steps. You can have drops of 300 to 500 points, for example, in Dow on one day, and then the next day you're up 200 to 400, or, or we haven't been up 400 in a while. But the point is that the movements down um, tend to be quickly executed and more intense than the counterbalancing movements up, particularly in the last six months, which is why I've said about the volatility is increasing because there's a jagged up and down going on in the market. That's usually the sign that the markets are, uh, you know, insecure, giving up their steam, whatever it might be, even with this almost seven year policy of cheap money and artificial liquidity being infused into these markets. So yes, any type of external a factor, whether it is something, and we've seen it, whether it's something that happens in Greece, whether it's something that happens in China, whether it could be a slew of credit default that could happen because there are a lot of leveraged loans that banks have been making in the last couple of years with this cheap money instead of helping individuals or, or smaller businesses with sort of more one-to-one -one loans versus their collateral that they're more leveraged for companies, in particular, for example, the oil and gas industry, shale, et cetera, have borrowed more than they actually have an operating capital to ever pay back. Any of those things can start to implode individually or at the same time, and that will have a very acute knock-on downward effect on the stock market here. We do see these things happening more recently and more frequently in the past amount of time. That's one of the reasons why the Federal Reserve this week, and no one paid that much attention to what they were saying this week, only because everything that was going on in Greece and China overshadowed um, them saying really the same thing that they've been saying for many, many months, which is, this time that they're not quite sure if things are stable enough to raise rates. A couple months ago, they were saying, well, maybe if things get a little stable, we can raise some rates. And now they're just so afraid that anything they do to interrupt the effectively free liquidity to the private banking system could have such an overriding negative effect, they're kind of backpedaling. So they're trapped then, don't they? They're trapped. They're absolutely trapped. The ECB is trapped. They've made really bad choices for seven years. And this started out as supposedly an emergency, temporary measure you know, during a period of time where, where the banks had effectively over leveraged the financial system and it leaked into the economy. And the idea on Capitol Hill and through the Federal Reserve and ultimately pushed to Europe and you know, to a lesser extent, the People's Bank of China and so forth globally was that if you, if you increase liquidity, if you make rates low enough, if you make money cheap enough, somehow it's going to go into the financial system, into the banking system, out to the general economy, and it's going to fortify the general economy and stabilize it. That never happened. So now we're seven years into what was supposed to be an emergency measure that hasn't done any of that. It's merely given the largest banks in the world the appearance of solvency because they're the ones who get the cheapest money and the most amount of it from these central banks. And they have, in turn, undergone a slew of, again, leveraged loans, of popping up the stock market, of working with their corporate customers to create bonds to basically increase their debt because the loans are so cheap. And the corporations, larger ones like Apple, IBM, and so forth, and use that money to buy their own shares, which again creates an artificial bump in the market. That's all that's happened in the last seven years. It's really just been a shell game of artificial liquidity through the banking system. Nothing has actually been solidified. And they are, they're stuck with their own bad policy and their own inability to articulate. Well, first of all, to imagine, but also to articulate what another policy could be. They've decided along the way, and it's same leaders that have been involved in this thing from the beginning. You had a little bit of a change from Ben Bernanke to Janet Yellen in the Fed, but I mean, that, that meant nothing <laughs> at all in terms of policy. I said that at the time. It's, it's, it's been consistently true. Um, but these people have not imagined doing anything different. They just imagine if they do more of the same thing, 
as scary as that might be because it's not actually produced stable results, that somehow eventually things are all going to wind up okay. It's, it's sort of the definition of, of insanity, right? You keep, you keep repeating the same thing over and over again, looking for a different outcome. That's what's going on. No, wait, let me ask you this. In your previous interview, and I'm quoting you repeatedly here, but because the timing of that interview was so amazing, the way you issued those warnings to the IMF, to the World Bank, to the Federal Reserve, you said, quote, I believe the coming collapse will be more devastating, end quote. Is what we just saw in China a preview of things to come? Yes, it definitely is. It's a question of when and how in terms of the ultimate impact of the cheap liquidity that's been infused into the markets and where that pushes the markets downward. But the reason I said and continue to say that the next financial crisis or, or the next leg of this one, because again, nothing's been actually remedied in, in, in reality, will be more devastating because it's now coming from a higher height of artificiality. We've had between, for example, the Federal Reserve and the ECB, the European Central Bank, $7 trillion worth of simply buying debt, and not much of it from or through the major private banks that caused the financial crisis to begin with. That helped nothing in terms of solidity. So when I spoke at the Federal Reserve IMF World Bank Conference last month, early June, and, and we discussed, I talked about the instability. And, and part of the reason for the conference was to address what supervisors and regulatory bodies could do to foster the sharing or the health to Main Street through the private banking system, not necessarily admitting it wasn't happening, but still seeking solutions for how it could happen, that the stability is really, really acute. And so because of that, because there's been no reform, because there's been no change in policy, because it's only been a push the can sort of mentality with this freely printed, freely electronically created money throughout the system, there is no way it can't collapse from this higher height. This even happened, you know, after Glass-Steagall repeal in 1999. We had all these banks sort of merging, and they created all this debt. They're all happy because also energy companies could merge, telecom companies could merge. It was, it was a big merger fest with all this cheap money. Stock markets went up really quickly, and then they just imploded. Um, you know, the credit markets went up, and, and markets went up in the 2000s after that when money was cheap, and then it imploded. So that pattern will happen again. It will happen from a higher height, which is why it will be more quick when it unravels, and it will be more negatively impactful on ordinary individuals when it happens. I'm going to close with this, Nomi. I know that this cycle is going to end in absolute terror. You're talking about the fact that there is no saving this global financial system. That's what you said to me last time, and you just covered that briefly there. But, you know, this is going to be terrifying for people to live through. And I'm just wondering... What do you say to people ahead of this coming collapse so that they can be prepared at least a little bit mentally? Because what we saw in China, if that's a preview of things to come, that means it's going to be hair-raising as we go through this. It's going to be frightening for people. Absolutely. But what I say and what I've particularly been saying during this increase in volatility period, which is indicative of, of coming to some point of implosion, whether it happens in two months or one year, you know, we still have a lot of uh, help coming in from the central banks to counterbalance here and there. But I just think that people should consider if they have exposure to these markets, um, particularly from a, from a stock perspective, and they have the ability to retract some of that, whether, you know, whether that is taking profits or breaking even, and keeping cash on the side or, or out of the system, this is a really good time to do it. You know, there is a potential to miss an upside, yes, but there's much more of a potential to save a better, a worse downside. And so keeping cash and really reducing any exposure to the financial system, particularly at this point, not waiting for it to go up too much again or, or thinking that you'll miss something if you do come out, that's the thing to do. I mean, that's, and I, I don't just say this to you and to listeners, and that's what I've done is taken all exposure I can out of that system. Now, people will still be exposed in general to what happens on an economic basis as they were in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008 into 2009 and beyond, and, and that is something that's harder to protect against. But these are moves the cash and the reducing exposure are more defensive moves, and they are not moves that will lose money. There are moves that will preserve money into either increased volatility or a major downfall in a lot of these markets. And also preserve your peace of mind as well as your money.
And as always, for people listening around the world, we are going to have a link directly to your book, All the Presidents as Bankers, on your interview page, Naomi. And also, listeners may be aware by now that you write for Gerald Salente and the Trends Journal, along with Dr. Paul Craig Roberts and others. You do that from time to time. It's an absolutely fantastic publication. People can buy that for less than 27 cents a day at trendsjournal.com. <laughs> say about Daryl Salente and, and Trends Journal and all the people that have contributed to it over the years that there's really no publication out there that has not been as thought on in terms of predicting trends, articulating the positives as well as the dangers for people, whether that's in economics or military activity or health care, because it's not just a fabulous publication and Daryl Salente is not just an amazing foreseer of the future an articulator of what's going to happen, that journal and what's in it has been so right on. And so I really say from the bottom of my heart that this is a probably help them. Nomi Prince, keynote speaker who just addressed the Federal Reserve, IMF, and World Bank, and author of All the Presidents' Bankers. Thank you for joining us on King World News.